So it's a real pleasure to, to have you um, on, on the reading group, uh, uh, Stanley. Um, your, your piece on um, Ancestor Temple in a Box, I think is so timely now that we're all um, seeing different forms of technologically mediated death proliferate during the coronavirus pandemic. And I couldn't help myself going back to waist hide and, and looking at viral themes in there that now, you know, it, it, for the first time I read it, as, as I was saying before we went on, on the air, um, was before the pandemic. And, you know, it's, it's a really lively and enriching story. And, and I think one that really tells um, some of the important stories about science and technology and innovation and inequality that get so often missed. One of the things I really love about Waste Hide is the way that it's both a technology gone awry, but it goes awry in kind of some generative ways, some, some ways that are generating, you know, social and um, political possibilities for, for people who've been structurally excluded um, from, you know, mainstream forms of, of economic uh, accumulation or, or even health and well being, you know, that people are living in these these mountains of, of, of waste and um, be dealing with the refuse of the world. And, and then, you know, we have this uh, really interesting um, uh, take uh, of the ancestor temple in a box of, of, you know, traditions reinvented a new intergenerational tension where, um, you know, some, some people are, are kind of aspiring to carry on an older, older idea of what aesthetics and beauty might be. Um, what what art is in, in the mechanical age and age old question, and you know maybe my question to you is is as an author living living through a moment that you didn't quite ima imagine. I mean you 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 were thinking along um, these lines about um, both you know the the changing face of death as as it's mediated by technology, but also how viruses can go awry and suddenly interrupt um, you know stable human societies. What, what has it been like um, uh, during the pandemic for you, having, having speculated about a new future uh, that's, that's related to these themes? Yeah, uh, so first of all, thank you for organizing this uh, incredible event and thanks for having me here to meet everyone all around the world. So it seems to me like a super science fictional scenario that uh, post pandemic, uh, gatherings and online discussion is happening every now and then. So since last year, actually, I was uh, canceling all uh, most of my uh, on-site traveling, especially those international one is kind of impossible. So I spend a lot of time reading and writing and also doing this kind of uh, online uh, panel discussion. <clears throat> and and also, like uh, during this time, very special time, I also uh, got a lot of chance to revisit the thoughts, which is almost 10 years ago when I start to write uh, Waste Tide. It seems to me like this opportunity to revisit and rethink the global situation of like class divisions and geopolitical setting in the novel actually is going even further because not only this so-called class division, but also the pandemic division that not all the countries and areas, people has the chance to get vaccinated equally, right? So even now, countries like US and maybe China, we are donating uh, millions of shots to those less developed country, but still there's, of course, there's definitely a bunch of people, millions of people that couldn't get vaccinated. So <clears throat> I think it's, it's tragic, but it's also very real that we have to confirm the new reality. It might become the new norm over the next decades, I have to say. So we have to figure out how to live with it. So how we can leverage technology to create this kind of um, new environment that help us to live, to work, to entertain, and also to get socialized. Uh, I think most of them will be online and 
um, virtually. But meanwhile, it means that a lot of people which might be excluded outside of this uh, process, like those vulnerable groups, like indigenous people, like elder people, like those who are living in the less developed countries and areas might not have the appropriate accessibility to this technology. So they might got left behind totally. So that's something I'm concerned about. And I've just finished the new book entitled AI 2041, co-authoring with Dr. Kai Fu Li. So there are 10 stories setting in 10 different countries around the world. So it's all about AI in different areas like uh, pandemic, education, entertainment, military, and et cetera, et cetera. But the thing I want to amplify is those vulnerable people we have to focus on and we have to start to think about how we can support them since now. And we have to have we have to um, actively to create this kind of consensus that AI or technology is for everyone. It's not just for the privileged class, privileged people. And this should be an idea be accepted by the tech companies and the, all the governments and all this um, privileged people like the venture capital, et cetera. So I think, yeah, because we are confront this kind of civilization level disaster. And I, I don't think it will stop or vanish within month or years. So it's, it seems to me like, according to the Gaia theory, so actually is the accelerationist, which claim that the development of technology might resolve not all, but maybe most of the problem, but maybe will also trigger even more issues ecologically, endemically, uh, politically, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's now we have to rethink about the whole systematically, uh, the, the whole thing, the whole way, how we deal with the economy, how we deal with the, uh, uh, the, 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 the nature, the resources, and also those who suffer a lot from this, this process, from this so-called progress. So yeah, so that's what I'm thinking a lot quite recently in the past year until now. So I think that's definitely a lot of thing we have to, <clears throat> we have to explore maybe through science fiction, maybe through this kind of interdisciplinary conversation between scientists, artists, and also writers, thinkers. So we have to, stand together to build up some new resolution, some, some protocol towards the future because we have to work together unless you think you can walk along, you can fight against all this pandemic alone. That's kind of impossible, everyone sees that. So I think, yeah, it's tough and it's so difficult, but I think maybe science fiction could be a way to create this kind of consensus and to build up this kind of resonate. And, and yes, that's what I'm trying to do in the next. So I'm actually, I'm already like uh, come up with something for the sequel of Waste Tie. So it's definitely leading to what I've just mentioned. The, the big direction is like how human beings 
should work together to build up this kind of new civilization or so-called uh, planetary intelligence. So it's not only human centric, but also it's like uh, inclusively have other species, even artificial intelligence or this non-consciousness intelligence agency also part of it. So we have to think it in total different level, total different scale. So I've been talking to a lot of scholars, researchers and scientists and artists for sure. So around this year, so I think there's a lot of consensus there. So we all getting aware of this new situation. And I think we can create something for sure. So step by step from the scratch and yeah, we try to save the world in a very arrogant way, but I think that's the only way we have to do it. So from writing. So, so that's my thoughts during the last year and to this year. So I think there's a lot of things happening. So it totally changed uh, a lot of my life and also my, my uh, the way I think about myself and the world. So I totally would love to have more <clears throat> exchange idea with you, with every one of you and see how we can collaborate in the future, so. Thank, thank you for those thoughts. And maybe just picking up on, on, on one point, you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, how all, all of sociality and um, modes of relating has, has gone online these days. And, and one of the things that I really like about Waste Tide is that it shows us the afterlife of these technologies. Like these, these devices that we're talking on right now are eventually gonna have an afterlife. They're gonna have a place where they go in the world where they get, cracked open and disassembled and reassembled. And um, one of the things I, I think your, your work does so well is to just show us the underbelly of these elite fantasies of, of progress. And, the, and I think the ways that you're able to depict these near futures is also a really interesting refraction of current lived realities that we kind of peripherally know are there, but, you know, um, at least as an anthropologist, I haven't seen the same kind of ethnographic work that might happen. So, so maybe if, if you could tell us a little bit, so uh, Giyu, I believe is, is the, the electronic waste dump. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. You, you grew up near there and, and uh, visited there. I'm, I'm reading a, a thing from Verge, which talks about just the the, the black smoke and the sort of the, the blue or green smoke and, and all the toxins that you felt permeating your body and, and every living thing when you went there. Um, so, so I was wondering if you could bring us a, a little bit more into that, that world that you lived through, that you experienced as, as someone living nearby, as, as a visitor to that place. And, and also here, I, you're, you're talking about these new books. Um, do, you, do you see other similar places, sort of zones of disregard where those same sorts of um, uh, you know, underbellies of, of the elite fantasies are playing out that, that you haven't seen described elsewhere. Yeah, right. So speaking of like Guiyu, so is uh, all Silicon Isle in the book. So actually it's about one hour's drive from the city I was lit. So <clears throat> it's not far, it's like 60 kilometers away, but before that, before I start to write a book, I actually have no idea of the existence of Guiyu. So um, I think it's kind of just a reflection of how waste or garbage was shown in our daily life is kind of invisible, right? You just put it into, dump into the, to the, to the can to the trash can and it just disappeared. It seems like magic, but there's somebody else. There's some people, there's some place has to take care of this waste and suffer from this whole process of recycling. So that's why I got totally shocked when I personally uh, visited there and 
because in the city, everything is so clean and neat. And you have no idea how this, all this ele electronic devices might end up in that kind of disaster uh, scenarios and people, how they suffer from their everyday life just to make some money because of the ecosystem there is running uh, for quite a long time. I think it was back to the 90s. So it's like maybe 10 or even 20 years. So everyone seems to get used to that uh, situation, <clears throat> but those richer people, they already move out because they don't want their children to get polluted or get damaged by this kind of pollution. But the, the rest of the waste workers actually is those who uh, uh, from other less developed areas in China, like those Sichuan province, maybe Guizhou province, those <clears throat> poor, poor, poor province. So they have to um, make money out of this <clears throat> very bad uh, job. So that reminds me that it's, there's a lot of like hidden structure behind the thing, right? So it seems to be very well organized, but actually it's not. So it's driven by the capital and it's driven by maybe the local government and maybe by all these clans who are running the business. And luckily it was changed like to 2018. So I think it took almost 10 years to change the whole situation. So now it's getting cleaner, the air, the water is, uh, right now it seems to be clean, but the soil maybe take longer because the heavy metals in the soil might, might took quite a decade to, to get, to, to be clean. So I think right now the people, the workers there can, <clears throat> uh, can do their job in a more safe and well-protected uh, environment using all these technologies. And also they have, uh, healthcare insurance, everything. So I think it's changing. But meanwhile, when the book was published, I got to know that there's not only one Gui in the world. So there's South Africa, there's Southeast Asia, India, et cetera, et cetera. So, so many less developed countries or areas, they have this kind of similar waste island so they have to deal with all this trash from developed countries. So China right now banned all this in import of uh, 24 types of foreign waste. So all this thing has to be thrown into someone else's backyard. So that's how the world's running, right? So that's why in 2019, I think that's a lot of protest like evoke in Philippines. So it's against uh, the foreign waste from Canada. So there's a lot of pro protest on the street and also in Thailand. So I met some activists who are organizing this kind of uh, league. So they try to organize in all these countries in Southeast Asia to fight against this kind of e-waste import from the West, Western countries. So I think that's totally a train that people start to realize that is not a healthy way to grow their economy. And they have to find another way, the alternative to reproduce all this toxic uh, industry. So that's why I think this book might got some uh, positive feedback and create some connection with people all around the world because I read those reviews from South Africa and also from India. I think the people there totally resonate because that's how they feel, how they suffer from the reality. So I think it's a book about global sounds.
So I, I, and in the future, I think I'll definitely write more about global south. And in the new book, AI 2041, it's actually, I think more than half of the stories is about, is happening in global south countries. For example, Nigeria and also Brazil, and also I think, uh, and India, Sri Lanka, and yeah, so so there's so many stories happen there and talking about how people react and respond to this kind of future shock induced by AI over the next 20 years. So that's my answer. Thank you. I can't wait to read both your new books. Um, I've got tons of other questions. If, if others have qu questions, feel free to raise your hand or, or just unmute yourself. Um, I've got some questions about ancestral temple in a box, but also just one last one on waste tide. Um, so you talk about a, a viral technology. It's, it's kind of one of the key plot points where a, a virus combines with heavy, heavy metals in the brain of, of Mimi, um, your, your protagonist. And um, it, it's it's kind of like a, a story of um, you know high tech interventions gone sideways, but also there, there's sort of what I might term an emergent ecology to this to this place where unexpected things happen, a, an emergence that wasn't foreseen, that wasn't you know kind of pre-programmed or planned. And um, to me, that that's one of the re most remarkable things about the book too is is that it. It's it's the space where um, it's a multiplicity of, of agencies in play. You know, you've got the viral, you've got the tech, technological intervention, you've got these um, these hulking machinic robots um, that are sort of in various states of disrepair and, and disuse that get reanimated. Um, so so and and you also have sort of a haunting spirit in, in there as well. Um, so so I I'm I'm just really fascinated at, at the really masterful way that you've played all these agencies together. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's more of a comment than a question. I, I just love love the specificity of agency as it's playing, but also the, the way that, you know, no one can really predict what's gonna happen next. It's, it's not like it's a pre-designed plan, but it's the intersection of these agencies. And, and, and I think we sort of see this similar sort of thing with the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. It's, you know, it's, it's not like anybody planned it as, as much as, um, you know, everyone wants to blame each other like, oh, it's, it's, it's a leak from that lab. No, it's your fault. Um, you know, it's, it's an intersection of agencies that weren't properly, you know, theorized or, or weren't properly noticed. And now we're in a, a situation where everyone's life has been disrupted. So, um, yeah, I, I, I guess maybe what, what drew you to that plot point and, and you know, how, how did you come to think of, so, so I guess it's a viral battery technology that you're, you're imagining. Um, you've got the corporate, the corporate spy who's trying to reclaim it, but, but then, you know, it, the virus basically causes an uprising or, or causes a leader who needs an uprising. So I, I just love the way that it's come together and think it's really fruitful for thinking about viral possibilities for humanity. Right, I think it's quite relevant to my childhood uh, experience because in the in the place I was born and grow grew up, I think it's just like the mixture of all these agencies you've mentioned. Because, like the city I've go, uh, I was born as Shanto is one of the first four uh, special economic zones in China. So it's opened up since actually the same year I was born. So that's that's the history of uh, of of myself and also the city. So when that happened, so a lot of new technologies and information actually was introduced from the West, especially from Hong Kong. So all those from the states from Japan, from Europe, are uh, flood, flood, flooding in. So you can see all this kind of new electronic devices since I was a kid. So it's kind of fashion, it's kind of chic. 
So everyone try to buy some new stuff. But meanwhile, <clears throat> we are living a very superstitious life. Maybe those people who live in the southern part of the world might uh, got a feeling that, um, yeah, because we're close to the ocean and there's always fishermen, they try to uh, get some, uh, some goddess uh, protection before they went out to the sea for shipping, for, for uh, fishing. So I think there's a lot of like rituals there and very strong sense of spiritual. So that's something I've uh, encountered and experienced since very young. So that's part of my life. So that's, you can see all this mixture it's coexisting together, like all this latest technology, all this latest, even the sci-fi movie like Star Wars, Star Trek, and all this animation is coming to me. But meanwhile, we, are, we have this kind of celebration, ceremonies and rituals, and we have this kind of shaman in our daily life. So even any big things happen, we will went to the shaman. It's not called shaman, but it's like the oracle. So they will predict something even before I, I, I go to the university, I have to pass the exam. So that's the entry exam of the university. That's the biggest one, the biggest thing in Chinese life. So my mom took me to an oracle <clears throat> and asked him, a, a very old guy. And my, my son tried to get into Peking University. So can he, even made it <clears throat> and the guy checked on the book a very old book it's like a, it, 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 it put a lot of numbers like the the date the the, the hours you were born and he can check just like a database and he said okay it's totally fine because it was written no matter what kind of school is applying is definitely can get in. So that's how it works in our daily lives. So everything is so combined all together. So that's, I think that's the way it influenced me when I try to write waste type because it's setting in my hometown. So I try to put everything all together and to shape this world with different layers even sometimes it seems so conflict because people some readers say okay you have so advanced technology but meanwhile those people have this kind of superstitious mindset why i i think i i, I have to respond because that's how i live that's where i was from and that's how i understand the world so i think that could be an answer to your question. Thanks. Alex, I, I see you have your hand up. I, I just, yeah, I mean, I was just wondering if you could tell me what would have been the implication um, if if the the Oracle had said, no, no. sorry, mate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what would yeah. have happened then? I think there's some kind of psychologically uh, implication there like if he say no maybe i feel so frustrated and i might not get into the university right but i think <clears throat> i i'm not quite clearly remember when did this happen is it before or after the exam so maybe it was after the exam so it's it it, it 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 changed nothing because it, I already took the exam, right? So it only affects my my emotion, only affects my my expectation. So yeah, it's, there's always some this kind of superstitious and coincidence and karmas here and there. So I heard a lot of this kind of story or fairy tales 
since kid or ghost stories since kid. So it was told by my grandparent, by my mom, by every relatives. So as kind of the convention, kind of the tradition of our culture. So I think I, I, I didn't really think about it, but I'm happy the guy told me I can do it. So, so I, it, it was a happy ending anyway. <laughs> I think that it's it also points to you know a, a, a like a Western fallacy uh, around the relationship between um, scientific knowledge um, and uh, and um, you know uh, older more traditional forms of understanding the world right. that they that they are in some way mutually exclusive and I and I think the the you know the polarity it can be compared to the polarity we would also plays out which is between that of apprehension and that of comprehension and the idea in western science that to comprehend a thing is, a, is almost to cancel its apprehension that you apprehend a thing first you you see it you perceive it without understanding what it is and right. that's really not valid you know the only valid thing is the end result when we finally test it and get to a, a complete and you know full uh, uh, understanding or knowledge of the thing, which we never do in, in in science, but that's what science promises us, and that you know, and that you know, and that sort of invalidates that that older way of looking at the world as though as though because we have advanced our scientific understanding, we are going to somehow eclipse, um, you know, the more uh you know what what get what get gets called magical way of understanding the world, and 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 it doesn't happen at all. In fact science as it proceeds as it you know it's funny i'm just reading the dialectic of enlightenment and they basically talk about how you know how in the enlightenment becomes inhabited by all of the myths that it debunks right. and it, it becomes to inhabit that space that it that it captures from there and 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 so you know I, and i think that was that played out very much in this in the story that we all read of yours um in that relationship between this ancient tradition and this technological attempt to to perpetuate it right melanie you've also got your uh, hand up yes thank you so much um this is very fascinating i i love the story and i i can't wait to read the books um you know, I'm interested to, to know more about your take on, on how we situate and define progress, because when we compare all this, I mean, Western technologies, even those like yet to come, like the really cutting edge stuff, but you compare that to the like kind of ancestral, traditional, indigenous um, technologies, they already seem old, like even the stuff that is yet to come already seems, seems outdated. Um, and I think, I mean, that also like resonates very much in in I think what you said like in the global south like in in southern Africa you know there's, there's people who, who can make rain who can make lightning who can travel in wheat baskets even like in kind of pre-Christian Christianity pre-Christian Switzerland where I'm from the stories about people making avalanches who were then like persecuted as as witches so a lot of this old stuff um like we would like from a western technology point of view now describe as as futuristic but but um, it's yeah. Is it what 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 does it say about about scientific progress? Yeah, I totally got your points. Yeah. So yeah, I think this question is kind of big, and there's so many layers there about progress because I I I've just visited uh, some very poor. A uh, minority village in Guizhou province, so it's in the mountainous area. So maybe those villages are the poorest area in the whole country. So they are living in a very traditional style. So they will farm on the mountain and they are uh, breeding all this duck and fish and everything. So it's like uh, uh, a, a micro ecosystem so it's running so well but nobody make big money because they are self sustainable but when the Han you know Chinese people get in there and bring this kind of technology and science they have this kind of internet 
and they have electricity and they have all this blah 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 so so more than living style <clears throat> and people start to think about making money so there were some young people that might leave the village and go to the big cities and try to make money and become a citizen living in the big city mega city but it turned out to be like after several years those young people might coming back and they think it's not their life and they try to help these villagers in the old village and to maintain their culture to maintain their traditions so i think it's quite a, a quite relative concept about progress on the on one hand they're living a better life they have electricity now they have tap water they don't have to work as tough as they used to be and they make much much more money than they used to be but on the other hand they feel this kind of anxiety they feel so much competitive so they're living under much more uh, much more stressful way so compared to the tradition way so i think people they because they were passively to accept this kind of so-called progress but meanwhile they have no power to preserve the old ways because it was taken as out of date old fashion and is low or lack of efficiency. So I think there's totally a lot of conflicts there because people's mindset is not always changing as fast as technology. They might feel, okay, today I want to make more money and then I can buy the apartment in the city. But the next day, why? I should be laid back just as my parents did. And I should totally enjoy this kind of very natural lifestyle, just as those urbanists, they try to move out of the city and they go into the village side and try to find that this kind of countryside life. So there's a lot of conflictions there and there's a lot of confusing mindsets there. So I couldn't say easily is black or white, good or bad, but I think it's, it's a process. So every country, every area, we're facing this kind of process because right now science or technology is considered as the biggest or the major narrative of modern society. So besides that everything seems to be peripheral, so it's minor, or is like uh, not as scientific at all, not updated. So I think right now it's time to revisit the tradition and to respect the, uh, the, the, the genuine way of living, especially for those indigenous people and minority people. So because there are so many wisdoms there, for example, during the pandemic, maybe people will find that maybe in the big city is more dangerous. Maybe living up in the mountain is more, is safer, is right? So because it's so isolated from the outside. So also there's a lot of like medicines was developed out of the rainforest. So that's those part those part of knowledge and, and experience, which is owned by the indigenous people. But like modern people, we are just didn't respect enough. And maybe we, we just losing our chance to save ourselves. So I think totally diversity is so important because if we only have one narrative, we can only one thing over top of the others, then 
we might just couldn't see the whole picture. So because the word is holistic, it's not just black and white. It's the dual. The, the, the dualism, I think, is so toxic because you are thinking in either or. But to me, it's like you have to accept the differences and you have to think in a more inclusive way. So I think that's, that's why I, I think it's so important to have all these conflicts elements included in my stories. So I try to put them all together and show people how they react and how they inter interact. Thank you. And, and I might just uh, make an observation, the, the hands are stacking up, but um, I, I think what, what your story about the ancestor uh, temple illustrates is, is a profound ambivalence about technology. The, the first lines are about these emoji that, that you know, the, di the relative of the dying father doesn't really understand. Um, the last line of the story is, is about, maybe it's time to put the box away. And, but, but at the same time, it's playing with the invention and reinvention of tradition, thinking about, you know, alienation from, from geography and home, um, the displacement uh, of, of, you know, earlier modes of, of doing craft, but, but also, yeah, the, you know, spectacles are are exciting. You know, there, there's all those people following the live stream, but they're also ultimately alienating. If, if we go back to Debord, who who theorizes the spectacle as the image that unites, like we're all looking at an image, but we're not looking at each other. Um, so so it, it, the, the story really speaks to a lot of key themes in cultural studies, the, the academic field that a lot of us re relate to as well as science and technology studies. I think that there's a real productive ambivalence in the story. Um, but I'll, I'll um, let Anne also chime in too, unless you have a, a direct response. Yeah, um, it was great uh, reading um, the ancestral temple in a box. Uh, my own research is also on, on, on robots and AI in Japan, and I thought, of uh, Mindar, there is this robotic uh, uh, Buddhist priest uh, you might have heard of it uh, yeah. in, in Kyoto. Yes. So, but my question is about I have two questions. One is broader. Uh, in what way is uh, Chinese, can you say a little bit more about in what way Chinese sci fi is different from American sci fi? In, in, in what way would it, uh, um, yeah, it be, be different? And my second question is. Um, you spoke uh, about your new book, AI 2041, and the protocol of the future. And in what way um, do you also include a, a set of moral and ethical values if, if, uh, if, if the future is going to be more and more uh, AI inclusive, also emotional technologies? I mean, this is also something that is very pertinent to, to Japan. In what way do you uh, discuss that as well uh, in maybe your new book or in other uh, works? Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Um, so for the first one, I have to say this question is kind of big. And yeah, I've been asked for so many times, but I, I don't think I have the very precise and confident answer for now because all I read and all I experience, I think, most of the Chinese science fiction works and authors are strongly influenced by the West sci-fi. So especially the United States. So they <clears throat> actually, there are so many similarities in their writing. But now I think the, the authors, they, start to realize that we try to build up our identity and our own narrative, but I don't think it's, it's confident enough to say we already find a path. So for now, I can see all those like storytelling structures and themes skill sets, I think it's pretty much from the West. So besides we're using Chinese characters, speaking Chinese, happen in China and 
given there's some cultural elements and appropriation. So, but to me, it's just could happen in South Africa, in Brazil, in elsewhere in the world. So that's not necessary to be a claim that is the 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 the, the key uh, differences between the two. So I, I I have to say that I don't have a very solid answer for that. But I think in the future, maybe when we have accumulate enough authors and books, and we might finally, we can say there's some certain pattern there emerging from the Chinese science fiction and author. So you can see it's totally different from the West, especially from the USA. So I think, I think a lot of uh, scholars, they, they are studying in the field. So I, I'm pretty looking forward to the future results. So, and the second one is, uh, it's uh, in, um, sorry, uh, so what's the second one is? So yeah, the setting the moral and ethical values, do you discuss right. that in your works as well as it becomes right. a more machine inclusive society, yeah. Right, because in AI 2041, um, we intend, we intended to create a more, um, promising and optimistic future with AI technology, but it means that you couldn't describe AI as a like Terminator or how 9000, that kind of evil figure, right? But we have to build up some dramatic tension there. So is how compelling stories was told. So I think, ethnical issues definitely is a key point to that. For example, in the in one of the story, it was actually setting in India. So we discussed about a very sophisticated advanced AI insurance system can adjust your fee dynamically according to all your behavior and all your data. But what it reflects actually is the hidden structure, the hidden discrimination of the car system, which already banned back in the 1950, but it's still there existing in our language, our behavior, our social interaction. So this kind of technology actually reveal this close, this hidden structure. So that's one approach I try to tap in. So in the age of AI technology dominant society, so maybe there's a lot of hidden issues my got amplified and got reviewed and become visible. And people, tech company, the government, the tech engineers, and also the ordinary people, they have to be aware of this kind of structuralized inequity. So I think that's 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 something I I try to put in different stories. So happen in different countries. So I think that's the way I I handled it. So yeah. So I I, I I'm looking forward to your response when you read the book. Is supposed to coming out on September the 14th in US and UK. Thank you very much. Exciting, yeah, and, and I think that point travels to a lot of different sites that, you know, innovation and inequality often go hand in hand, whether we're talking about, you know, the electronic waste that you describe in waste, waste tide or these emergent algorithms or, or biotech, which, which I tried to grapple with, um, with my mutant project book. Um, Kiriaki, I, I think I'm butchering your name, but you had your <laughs> hand up and now it's down. Do you want to ask? Yeah, ask no, it? it's because actually um, my question overlapped with Anne's question about protocol towards the future and the new books. I think uh, it's already been answered as much to say 
thank you for everything that you're doing. And, and I feel like you're, what's interesting about your work, it has this call for action. And, and um, in, in academia and especially in anthropology, you know, there's a lot of scholarship now that calls for um, writing stories differently or, or being very careful with, our role, uh, with the words we use in describing the world and um, kind of calls for having texts that are more hopeful, that talk about collaborative survival. And so the, my question was gonna be along those lines and how you do it in your work. And I think in a way you, it seems that you are doing it in your upcoming book that I really look forward to reading it in September 14th. So that, that's, that was kind of my, my little comment. Um, I, I'm just interested as a fanboy, like, uh, wait, tell us more about the sequ sequel to Waste Tide, if you're able to give us a little bit of a, a, a sneak preview of, of your thinking and, and how, how does this world continue on in, in, um, in, in the next yeah. iteration? So actually you will be set in uh, the Bay Area of China. So it's like in Shenzhen, Hong Kong and Macau. So it's also close to the first book. So it's not that far away. And also because in Shenzhen, there's so many people from Chaoshan is my hometown. So basically there's like maybe one fifth of the people, the population there is speaking Chaoshan dialects. So I, I'll continually explore this kind of culture. So I'll not call it minority, but I'll say it's very special culture there. In, in, even in China, like the dialect is so difficult that nobody elsewhere understand it, even compared to Cantonese. So I think, and also there's so many big bosses, big names like Pony Ma, the boss of Tencent is from Chaoshan. So there's so many big names and also the, the richest guy in Hong Kong is from Chaoshan. So we're all from the same place. They are called the Eastern Jewish. So, so, so it's very interesting. So maybe there's some similarity there because they are spreading all around the world. So there are so many like diaspora people all around the world speaking the same dialects. So that's something I will try to explore. And also I try to explore the concept of the AI uh, governance city. So I think it's definitely gonna happen over the next maybe 20 years. And I think China and Shenzhen will be a perfect uh, location for this imaginary setting. And, and also together with the futuristic uh, medium uh, paradigm shift. So there'll be like metaverse. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this uh, concept is actually is was brought up by Neil Stephenson back in the snow crash in 1992. So right now it's a big hit in the industry is mentioned about uh, integrating all this kind of AR, MR, VR, and create some parallel world, which is also correspondingly connected to the physical world. So everyone could have their avatar and they can work and live in the virtual world. Meanwhile, is have physical inference in the real world. So that's kind of very holistic concept of the reality is, I think it can be called as hyper reality in a way. So back, uh, back to the concept uh, created by John Baudelaire. So I think there's supposed to be a lot of things so interesting could happen in this world building. And also my, protagonist will still be fit, a female, futuristic girl, but in different positions. So they might try to explore the uh, purpose of life. And also I might bring in the concept of uh, the ancestral temple in the books 
in this one. So I think that's totally in the same setting. So there will be virtual tempo there and there's some <clears throat> people die and you still can figure out how to interact and how to dig into some heritage of the died person. So it's like treasure hunt. So maybe there are some lost memories there. So just like you find out in some treasure cases and there's something lead to the conspiracy. So there's, so there's always conspiracy. Yeah, so, so that's basically the idea, so. Wait, I really uh, have enjoyed this conversation and hope, hope to stay in touch. Um, th thank you so much for, for sharing your, your words with us and uh, this, this virtual dialogue. And, and I hope someday we can, we can have a, a, a physical meetup in, in the post-pandemic yeah. world. Well, post-pandemic is probably not quite the right imaginary, but as, as it becomes possible, I, I hope it, it happens. So, so thank you again. And uh, it's good to see so many of you back in, in the Zoom room. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank Bye. You. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye. Thank you.